You have two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Well, 67 percent of the people voted to reelect me when I ran for my second term, and I was very proud and very humbled by that. Mr. Carter, I have tried my entire life to do what I can to support children and families. You know, right out of law school, I went to work for the Children's Defense Fund, and Donald talks a lot about, you know, the 30 years I've been in public service. I'm proud of that. You know, I started off as a young lawyer working against discrimination against African American children in schools and in the criminal justice system. I worked to make sure that kids with disabilities could get a public education, something that I care very much about. I have worked with Latinos. One of my first jobs in politics was down in South Texas registering Latino citizens to be able to vote. So I have a deep devotion, to use your absolutely correct word, to making sure that every American feels like he or she has a place in our country. And I think when you look at the letters that I get, a lot of people are worried that maybe they wouldn't have a place in Donald Trump's America. They write me, and one woman wrote me about her son, Felix. She adopted him from Ethiopia when he was a toddler. He's 10 years old now. This is the only country he's ever known. And he listens to Donald on TV, and he said to his mother one day, will he send me back to Ethiopia if he gets elected? You know, children listen to what is being said, to go back to the very, very first question. And there's a lot of fear that, in fact, teachers and parents are calling it the Trump effect. Bullying is up. A lot of people are feeling, you know, uneasy. A lot of kids are expressing their concerns. So first and foremost, I will do everything I can to reach out to everybody, Secretary Democrats, Clinton. Republicans, independents, people across our country. If you don't vote for me, I still want to be your president. Your I want to be the up. best president I can be for every American. Secretary Clinton, your two minutes is up. I want to follow up on something that Donald Trump actually said to you, uh, a comment you made last month. You said that half of Donald Trump's supporters are, quote, deplorables, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. You later said you regretted saying half. You didn't express regret for using the term deplor deplorables. To Mr. Carter's question, how can you unite a country if you've written off tens of millions of Americans? Well, within hours, I, I said that I was sorry about the way I, I um, talked about that, because my argument is not with his supporters. It's with him and with the hateful and divisive campaign that he has run and the inciting of violence at his rallies and the very uh, brutal kinds of comments about not just women, but all Americans, all kinds of Americans. And what he has said about African Americans and Latinos, about Muslims, about POWs, uh, about immigrants, about people with disabilities, he's never apologized for. And so I do think that a lot of the tone and tenor that he has said, I'm proud of the campaign that Bernie Sanders and I ran. We ran a campaign based on issues, not insults, and he is supporting me 100 percent. Thank you. Because we talked about what we wanted to do. We might have had some differences, and we had a lot of debates. Thank you, Secretary. But we believed that we could make the country better, and I was proud of that. I'll give you a minute, 20 seconds. We have a divided nation. We have a very divided nation. You look at Charlotte. You look at Baltimore. You look at the violence that's taking place in the inner cities, Chicago. You take a look at Washington, D.C. We have a increase in murder within our cities, the biggest in 45 years. We have a divided nation because people like her, and believe me, she has tremendous hate in her heart. And when she said deplorables, she meant it. And when she said irredeemable, they're irredeemable. You didn't mention that. But when she said they're irredeemable, to me, that might have been even worse. She said she's some of them tremendous, are irredeemable. She's got tremendous hatred. And this country cannot take another four years of Barack Obama. And that's what you're getting with her. Mr. Trump, let me follow up with you. In 2008, you wrote in one of your books that the most important characteristic of a good leader is discipline. You said if a leader doesn't have it, quote, he or she won't be one for very long. In the days after the first debate, you sent out a series of tweets from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m., including one that told people to check out a sex tape. 
Is that the discipline of a good No, leader? it wasn't check out a sex tape. It you, was just take a look at the person that she built up to be this wonderful uh, Girl Scout who was no Girl Scout. You mentioned By the, the way, just tape. so you understand, when she said 3 o'clock in the morning, take a look at Benghazi. She said, who's going to answer the call at 3 o'clock in the morning? Guess what? She didn't answer because when Ambassador Stevens... The question is, is that the discipline minute, of a good leader? 600 times. Well, she said she was awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. And she also sent a tweet out at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I won't even mention that. But she said she'll be awake. Who's got the famous thing? We're going to answer our call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Guess what happened? Ambassador Stevens, Ambassador Stevens sent 600 requests for help. And the only one she talked to was Sidney Blumenthal, who's her friend and not a good guy, by the way. So, you know, she shouldn't be talking about that. Now, tweeting happens to be a modern day form of communication. I mean, you can like it or not like it. I have, between Facebook and Twitter, I have almost 25 million people. It's a very effective way of communication. So you can put it down, but it is a very effective form of communication. I'm not unproud of it, to be honest with you. Secretary Clinton, does Mr. Trump have the discipline to be a good leader? No. I'm shocked to hear that. Well, it's, it's, it's not only my opinion, it's the opinion of many others, uh, national security experts, Republicans, former Republican members of Congress. But it's in part because those of us who have had the great privilege of seeing this job up close and know how difficult it is, and it's not just because I watched my husband take a $300 billion deficit and turn it into a $200 billion surplus, and 23 million new jobs were created, and incomes went up for everybody, everybody. African-American incomes went up 33%. And it's not just because I worked with George W. Bush after 9-11, and I was very proud that when I told him what the city needed, what we needed to recover, he said, you've got it, and he never wavered. He stuck with me. And I have worked, and I admire President Obama. He inherited the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. That was a terrible time for our country. We have to move along. Nine million people Secretary lost their Clinton, jobs. We have to... Five million homes were lost. Secretary and Clinton, we're moving on. And $13 trillion in family wealth was wiped out. We are back on the right track. He would send us back into recession with his tax plans. Secretary Clinton, we are moving to an audience question. We're almost out of time. We have, we have another. Mr. Trump, we're moving to an audience question. Since 1929, it is our country Mr. Trump, has the Secretary slowest Clinton, growth, and jobs get to are a the disaster. Audience. Thank you very much, both of you. <laughs> we have another audience question. Beth Miller has a question for both candidates. Um, good evening. Perhaps the most important aspect of this election is the Supreme Court justice. What would you prioritize as the most important aspect of selecting a Supreme Court justice? We begin with your two minutes, Secretary Clinton. Thank you. Well, you're right. This is one of the most important uh, issues in this election. Um, I want to uh, appoint Supreme Court justices who understand the way the world really works, who have real life experience, who have not just been in a big law firm and maybe clerked for a judge and then gotten on the bench, but you know, maybe they tried some more cases. They actually understand what people are up against because I think the current court has gone in the wrong direction. And so I would want to see uh, the Supreme Court uh, reverse Citizens United and get dark, unaccountable money out of our politics. Donald doesn't agree with that. I would like the Supreme Court to understand that voting rights are still a big problem in many parts of our country, that we don't always do everything we can to make it possible for people of color and older people and young people to be able to exercise their franchise. I want a Supreme Court that will stick with Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to choose, and I want a Supreme Court that will stick with marriage equality. Now, Donald has put forth the names of some people that he would consider. And among the ones that he has suggested are people who would reverse Roe v. Wade and reverse marriage equality. I think that would be a terrible mistake and would take us backwards. I want a Supreme Court that doesn't always side with corporate interests. I want a Supreme Court that understands because you're wealthy and you can give more money to something doesn't mean you have any more rights or should have any more rights than anybody else. So I have very clear views about what I want to see to tend to change the balance on the Supreme Court. 
And I regret deeply that the Senate has not done its job and they have not permitted a vote on the person that President Obama, a highly qualified person, they've not given him a vote to be able to have the full complement of nine Supreme Court justices. I think that was a dereliction of duty. Uh, I hope that they will see their way to doing it, but if I am uh, so fortunate enough as to be president, I will immediately uh, move to make sure that we fill that. We have nine Thank justices you, Secretary and we Clinton. get to work on behalf of our people. Thank you. You're out of time, Mr. Trump. Justice Scalia, great judge, died recently, and we have a vacancy. I am looking to appoint judges very much in the mold of Justice Scalia. I'm looking for judges, and I've actually picked 20 of them, so that people would see, highly respected, highly thought of, and actually very beautifully reviewed by just about everybody, but people that will respect the Constitution of the United States. And I think that this is so important. Also, the Second Amendment, which is totally under siege by people like Hillary Clinton. They'll respect the Second Amendment and what it stands for, what it represents. Uh, so important to me. Now, Hillary mentioned something about uh, contributions, just so you understand. So I will have, in my race, more than $100 million put in of my money, meaning I'm not taking all of this big money from all of these different corporations like she's doing. What I ask is this. So I'm putting in more than, by the time it's finished, I'll have more than $100 million invested pretty much self-funding mine. We're raising money for the Republican Party, and we're doing tremendously on the small donation, $61 average or so. I asked Hillary, why doesn't she made $250 million by being in office? She used the power of her office to make a lot of money. Why isn't she funding, uh, not for $100 million, but why don't you put 10 or 20 or 25 or $30 million into your own campaign? It's $30 million less for special interest that will tell you exactly what to do. And it would really, I think, be a nice sign to the American public. Why aren't you putting some money in? You have a lot of it. You've made a lot of it because of the fact that you've been in office. You made a lot of it while you were Secretary of State, actually. So why aren't you putting money into your own campaign? I'm just curious. Well, Thank you very much. About, Thank you. We're going to get on to one more question. The question was about the Supreme Court, and I just want to quickly say— Very quickly. I respect the Second Amendment, but I believe there should be comprehensive background checks, and we should close the gun show loophole and close the online loophole. Thank you. We have, we we have one more question, as Mrs. Clinton. As we possibly can. We have one more question from Ken Bone about uh, energy policy. Ken? What steps will your energy policy take to meet our energy needs while at the same time remaining environmentally friendly and minimizing job loss for fossil power plant workers? Mr. Trump, two minutes. Absolutely. I think it's such a great question because energy is under siege by the Obama administration, under absolute siege. The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, is killing these energy companies. And foreign companies are now coming in, buying our buying so many of our different plants, and then rejiggering the plant so that they can take care of their oil. We are killing, absolutely killing, our energy business in this country. Now, I'm all for alternative forms of energy, including wind, including solar, et cetera. But we need much more than wind and solar. And you look at our miners. Hillary Clinton wants to put all the miners out of business. There is a thing called clean coal. Coal will last for a thousand years in this country. Now we have natural gas and so many other things because of technology. We have unbelievable, we have found over the last seven years, we have found tremendous wealth right under our feet. So good, especially when you have 20 trillion in debt. I will bring our energy companies back. They'll be able to compete. They'll make money. They'll pay off our national debt. They'll pay off our tremendous budget deficits, which are are tremendous, but we are putting our energy companies out of business. We have to bring back our workers. You take a look at what's happening to steel and the cost of steel and China dumping vast amounts of steel all over the United States, which essentially is killing our steel workers and our steel companies. We have to guard our energy companies. We have to make it possible. The EPA is so restrictive. 
that they are putting our energy companies out of business. And all you have to do is go to a great place like West Virginia or places like Ohio, which is phenomenal, or places like Pennsylvania, and you see what they're doing to the people, the miners and others in the energy business. It's a disgrace. Your time is up. Thank you, it's sir. It's an absolute disgrace.